Hello everyone, welcome, I am Nathan P. Butler, and this is my vlog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof. Just recently, I put out a call for questions because I was kind of going nuts not having a chance to really record much of anything, and it had been a while since we did one of these Q&A videos, so I figured, hey, let's toss it out there, give me some questions, and I'll answer them in a video here. It also gives me a chance to experiment a little bit. I've just recently, as you can probably tell if you watched most of my other videos, have done another upgrade of my equipment. My microphone is still the same, still my blue snowball mic, whenever I actually have the audio settings set up correctly. Um, but I have replaced an old Logitech uh, 720p webcam with a Logitech 1080p webcam. Um, so, you know, no 4K yet, but at least I'm slowly marching into the last decade or so. And um, I'm going to start trying to do some editing uh, with the program I actually use for work, which I'm now planning on buying, I got a trial right now, but planning on buying for personal use, uh, Camtasia, that gives me a little more options than my usual editing that I do in Movie Maker. Yes, Windows Movie Maker, which has served me well enough, but still not all that great. Um, so let me know what you think. Uh, I guess very quickly before we get started, this is sort of as close to an approximation of my old setup as I could get on this screen. Um, without changing where the computer is or anything like that based on the new placement of the camera. Uh, I also do have the option of going a little wider out, which would be something more like this. You see more, I'm smaller, and unless it's lifted up, I don't know of a good way to get the microphone top out of the picture here. So may go like this, may wind up sticking with the zoomed in version, which is what I'm planning on using today. But I'd welcome your thoughts anytime uh, we do any kind of new setup changes here. So I'm going to run through the questions, basically uh, start to finish the ones that have been asked uh, as of now on that uh, video asking for questions. So we start with Corey Newell, who asks, what are your favorite lines and or moments from all the live action Star Wars movies? So lines and or moments, so not necessarily both for each film. That's good, because my brain uh, might empty out too quickly. Uh, I would say probably for Phantom Menace, it's Obi-Wan's reaction when it comes to the fighting style uh, to Qui-Gon's death. Uh, when Qui-Gon has died, uh, Obi-Wan is kind of seething and whatnot behind the little ray barrier thing. And as soon as it opens, he sort of fights with abandon and a lot more speed and aggression than we saw from Obi-Wan before. I think it's one of the few times we ever really see Obi-Wan sort of lean in the same direction that we'll eventually see Anakin go in and then go too far and eventually uh, lead himself to becoming Vader. Attack on the Clones, I'd say my favorite moment of that one tends to be near the very end. Uh, there's no dialogue or anything, but as the music is rising and we have what sounds like the Imperial March turn into more of a patriotic Republic theme and we see the acclimators launching that are full of clone troopers to go off to war. And we have sort of this patriotic, they're marching off to war. But you've already got a little bit of that misgiving from what Yoda has said. And you see Bail Organa watching as this happens. And he just sort of looks down at the desk and does the, or the, the railing and does this like thumping of his fist. Kind of like, damn it. You know, like we know this is wrong. We know this is not a good idea. But we've been pushed into this position and now we have no choice. And he knows that it can't come to good. So I like that one. Uh, Revenge of the Sith is a little trickier because that's my favorite of the three prequels. I would still say probably uh, something along the lines of the, you know, you were my brother Anakin moment. Because it's one of the more human moments that we get from Obi-Wan. Some of the best acting we get out of the prequels. Not necessarily the, I hate you, response. Uh, but Ewan McGregor's delivery as Obi-Wan is great. Um, let's see. Um, A New Hope, I would have to go with primarily uh, the Battle of Yavin, just the very end bit. But not just the very end of the battle itself, the full ceremony afterwards. Because really, you get that emotional high of, you know, they just blew up the Death Star. And except for a very brief dip where there's not a lot of music to it, you know, where they're landing and, you know, you know, hey, or carry, whatever you want to say that he says. Um, the fact that it leads into that very triumphant music that's used for the ceremony, that's some of my favorite mu uh, music in the saga. Um, so that whole basically last, what, five, six minutes, 
or so of A New Hope, I would say, uh, which is especially cool if you get a chance to watch any of the videos where people have taken old recordings from inside the movie theaters in 77 or so, uh, or re-releases, and uh, they've matched up that audio to the video of the actual film so that you can see how people reacted back then to it, which is awesome, or at least hear how people reacted back then. Let's see. Uh, Empire. Hmm. I would say my favorite moment from Empire is the no I am your father scene, but not the revelation itself. It's Luke's decision afterwards. Okay, and especially in the different cuts of the film, you know, they keep changing the freaking films, you know, original version, special edition, more special edition, even more special edition, and so on as we go from, you know, 97, 2004 and onward. Um, but I like the fact that there's this, that moment where you can see Luke's moment of decision, where he has to decide, does he go with Vader or not? He looks down and sees that the only other choice is essentially letting go and falling to his fate, which may very likely mean death. And he just in that moment, the look comes over his face of um, solidifying the decision, and he just lets go passively. It's not a jump. It's not like a defiant, screw you, wee, kind of jump. It's more of a, I resign myself to my fate, and in defiance, he's gone, right? Um, that I've always thought is a fantastic moment. For Return of the Jedi, uh, again, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of big on the climactic scenes and such. For Return of the Jedi... It is the moment that Vader turns on the Emperor for me. Um, actually, I take that. It, it's it's the moment he turns on, and a few seconds before it, because it's something that I really didn't get as a kid, right? When I was little, I guess I didn't listen as closely to the dialogue in depth in certain scenes. So as Luke's getting zapped, uh, especially in more modern audio mixes, you know, the the better clarity that we get, say, with Blu-ray or DVD. You really can hear Luke's, you know, Father, please save me. And I guess I didn't really get that when I was a kid. Like, I heard him saying something, but for some reason it wasn't clicking what it was. Which is actually why, to tell you the truth, I don't have a huge problem with the no at the end of Jedi added for the Blu-ray. Because I think for a younger kid, needing to hear what Vader is thinking, in essence, in that moment, actually is an added helpful point of clarity for younger viewers that that is why he's doing what he's doing. Um, but to, to get to sort of hear Luke's cries and then Vader does it, um, that's huge. That's huge. And I don't think it's something that I really appreciated as much when I was little, so much as it was, oh, he just killed his boss. Or, oh, he just took down the Emperor. Or, oh, he just chose to side with Luke. There's so much more to it than that, especially coming from somebody now in my case, who's about to be a father. Like this morning, as I'm recording this, we just went in for the halfway mark ultrasound uh, to confirm that it is Cade, not Leia, that is coming, so it is a boy. Um, just all those things that are connected to the idea of the family themes of Star Wars, the fatherhood themes, um, particularly with the redemption theme as it relates to redemption through the family, all those types of things are just things that I never really, I guess, got as much into as a kid that I certainly do now. And uh, if there was another moment prior to that that just is the uh, uh, woohoo kind of moment, um, I would say that it's probably the destruction of the Death Star and just the, the intensity of that moment. As for the other live action films, the more recent live action films, the uh, new canon films that aren't in both continuities of Legends and Story Group canon, um, it's interesting that my favorite moment in both Last Jedi and Force Awakens is almost the same thing for very similar reasons. Um, for Force Awakens, it's when the lightsaber's sitting in the snow, Kylo's reaching for it, and instead it leaps, you see it go into Rey's hand, and we get the classic music from A New Hope starting to play. Um, but the music cue combined with just the effect of that moment from a storytelling standpoint I thought was fantastic. That's my favorite moment of that film, hands down. Um, but then Last Jedi, it's the same thing. It's not the moment of, you know, and kills his true enemy, blah, 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 blah. or whatever it is that Snoke is saying. It's not the blade through Snoke. It's that moment of Kylo himself doing the whole hand movement and it coming out of Snoke where she lifts up her hand and grabs it in midair. Um, there's just something in both of those cases and the music cues that are used with it 
that are great. And of course, in that case, it's followed immediately by the moments of you, you see the light from him igniting his saber. So for a split second, there's maybe a possibility, wait, is he going to attack her? Or is this so they can fight together? And you recognize immediately that the characters don't even have to think about it. They immediately turn to guard each other's backs uh, as the Praetorian Guard are coming forward. So those uh, favorites for me. As for Rogue One, I would say it's... It's probably, again, near the end of the film, it's probably the moment... I take it back. I think there's, there's actually there's three moments and I don't know which one to pick. Um, it's either the one I was thinking of, which is a uh, Krennic on sort of the balcony out there with Jin near the end where she's basically saying, you know, you've lost, etc. And he gives his line about how I lose nothing about time. For some reason, I guess every time I do an impression, I've got to <laughs> go all clay face or something or uh, like the dude on Flash. Um whatever. Um, but just sort of the, the, the confrontation there and the arrogance that he presents and the fact that he didn't get shot and, you know, it's all bull. Um, but I particularly also like the moments that give us insight into Cassian's character. I really like the Cassian Andor character as someone who gets into it for the right reasons, but gets into it when he's very young and gets sort of driven into this darker place of sort of doing the wrong things for the right reasons that eventually winds up with him being a character who's seeking essentially redemption or a reason to be able to say all this bad stuff that I've done really was worth it. Um, so the moment that he basically says something along those lines when joining Jin's team before they take off is a big moment for me. But also the, the, the argument that he has with Jin, which really is sort of putting those principles to the test, you know, about, you know, those were alliance bombs that killed him and so forth, and suddenly it's real for you now. Um, and it has probably his most memorable line for me, which is, you know, I've been in this fight since I was six years old. And he has that, the heavy accent as he says it. And that was one of those moments that, that led in part to a discussion on the whole idea of how Star Wars, when it comes to, uh, diversity, um, that Rogue One in many ways is the Star Wars that is most diverse in terms of accents being spoken for uh, more auditorily, um, diverse, which I thought was kind of interesting. So throw all those together. And a little bit of everything, but I do tend to lean towards those climactic moments for some reason. And a lot of times moments with lightsabers. Like when I listen to the Dark Empire audio drama, um, which is an audio dramatization that is made based off the original six-issue miniseries before the crappy six-issue follow-up and two-issue follow-up after that. Um, but the moment of Luke taking his lightsaber and throwing it down and dropping to his knees, yes, my father's destiny is my own, is a fantastic moment as well. For some reason, you know, those types of scenes stand out to me. The next one comes in from Zethus Thorne, who says, Would you watch some anime if I gave you some recommendations? And the recommendations given are Cowboy Bebop, Trigun, Eureka 7, Darling in the Franks? I guess that's how you say it. Uh, Devilman Crybaby, Guren Legan, if I'm saying that correctly, and Space Battleship Yamato 2199. I would say maybe... I tend to lean more towards Americanized anime, if that makes sense. So I tend to lean more towards, for instance... Like, I haven't ever watched Southern Cross or Genesis Climber Most Beta or uh, Macross. But I really loved Robotech at the time, which, of course, is the Americanized version that kind of combines those three together. Um, though I much preferred, actually, the novels of those, or the novelizations, if you want to call it that, of those, uh, by Jack McKinney, which is basically James Lucino and Brian Daly. Um, I really enjoyed those more than I enjoyed the show itself. Um, really, the only anime I've gotten more heavily into that was was straight up actually from Japan uh, would have been Silent Mobius. At one point, I saw the film version of it and then eventually saw a series that I thought was pretty good. Um, it's just not really the thing that I go for. Although right now I am actually, I just started in the last couple of days now that my Star Trek rewatch is done whew, after months and maybe over a year, actually, if you go back to Enterprise. Um, now that I'm actually done with that, I'm starting to finally catch up on watching all of Voltron Legendary Defender on Netflix, and eventually I'll be picking up with uh, Castlevania, uh, which I guess are done in an anime style, but I don't think they actually count as far as I know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they actually are counted as anime, but I don't think they are, because if I remember correctly, they were, they were created specifically for Netflix, so it may be that in style, but it doesn't have the cultural heritage to go back to. Um, 
But I might. I mean, I've got friends who are into it. Uh, going back and watching uh, Ready Player One got me interested a little bit in, um, oh God, what is it called? The Big Mech thing. Gundam. Gundam, yeah. Um, so maybe trying some of that at some point? Hard to say. Then we have a set of four questions here from, I believe it's Satyendra in Donny Banerjee, or Donny. If you can't pronounce my name, this person says, just call me Donny. There you go. Uh, anyway, I have several questions. I actually think, I have to go back and look, but I think this person may have been the person who initially suggested to me um, jumping to Camtasia to begin with. Um, but I forget, it's, it's been a little while. I just recognized the name. The name was standing out in my mind for some reason. So anyway, four questions. Number one, when was the first time you ever watched Star Wars and did it make you feel? I guess, how did it make you feel? Um... Honestly, I don't really remember the first time I saw it. I'm assuming that the first time I saw A New Hope was probably on television. I know that my mom took me to go see The Empire Strikes Back when I was a baby. And I always find that ironic because for me these days, if someone brings a baby into a movie theater, I want to strangle them. Not the baby, the parent. Because um, it's not the baby's fault that the parent's using poor judgment and bringing a baby to a freaking movie. Um, sorry, Mom. But then... uh. With Return of the Jedi, I actually do sort of remember having seen it in the theater um, when I was, what, three, four years old. So I remember seeing it in that sense and being really excited uh, excited by it and kind of being just sort of captured in the moment and wanting to go home and, you know, play with the toys and stuff and recreate moments from the film and things like that. Um, but I'm not sure that I remember an exact feeling from the actual experience. I think it was more sort of... It's almost like for Star Wars for me... Until, I guess, I got old enough to really pick out certain aspects that really stood out to me and things like that, which I guess theatrically would have been for the special editions, because by that point I was in late high school. Um, I think instead it's more like Star Wars wasn't, here's this emotional trigger, here's this emotional trigger. It was more like, here's this just wave of Star Wars that crashes over you, and you're left there drenched like, that was cool, man. But it's kind of hard to pin down the individual drops of the wave, if that makes sense. Um, number two. Uh, out of eight, soon to be nine, episodic Star Wars movies, which is your favorite and least favorite? Uh, thus far, I would say, and this is going to annoy some people or cause other people to cheer, and honestly, don't care either way, because that's what personal opinion is all about. Um, my favorite right now is Last Jedi. Um, I like the uh, the twists and turns taken that went in directions not expected, um, the more human take on certain characters than mythical archetype, um, and I've really enjoyed seeing the roller coaster ride uh, of the psychology of Kylo Ren. I'm always into those psychologically damaged characters, and he certainly fits the bill. Um, I also like the fact that they're kind of going with the, uh, in essence, you know, it's not that he's, you know, the 1930s kind of Hitler-esque villain leading the space Nazis so much as he's the millennial kind of villain leading the space neo-Nazis, which is kind of a different take. I mean, it's it takes a special kind of, of crazy, a special kind of um, vitriol, a special kind of anger, a special kind of racism, hatred, whatever, to cause somebody to look back at something like the Empire and say, you know what? That was good. We need more of that. Yeah, I know that we have hindsight and can see all the bad shit that happened, but you know what? We need more of that. It takes a special kind of... <laughs> and in that sense, that's kind of what we get um, with the First Order. Let's see. Least favorite, uh, I would say at this point, is Phantom Menace. It's just tough for me to get through sometimes. Um, and I actually think it's probably put together as a better film than Attack of the Clones was. Uh, but I'm able to watch through Attack of the Clones without feeling like I'm dropping off in my attention a lot of times. Uh, in fact, that's why there have been many times I've tried to go ahead and start a marathon of I'm just going to watch all the Star Wars films straight through this weekend or this week or this whatever, and I get to near the end of Phantom Menace and I'm like, nah, it's cool. I've already seen them enough times. I could already recite most of them. It's all right. You know, it's just tough for me to get through. Um, not that it's bad per se, there's just certain aspects that kind of turn me off, but I think it's because it feels so disconnected from the rest. It's, in essence, if the prequels are a prequel to the original trilogy, 
to some degree, episode one is a prequel to episodes two and three. It's almost like a prologue to the entire saga because it ha does have that 10-year disconnect um, between episodes one and two. Number three, and I think we got a couple missing words, so, so bear with me if I try to fill these in. I believe the question is, uh, do you feel or think the prequels, particularly in episode three, bring a little bit of social commentary to today's American politics? In other words, do you think Chancellor Palpatine is somewhat like President Trump? And there's a laugh out loud after it. Um, I'm not sure that I would have said Trump. I think Palpatine is a an incredibly scheming... Like, like they talk about how uh, the people who are the apologists for some of the dumber things that Trump does, and I would say that Trump is a mixed bag like most presidents have been. I can point to some things I particularly think he's done well. Other things I think he's just been a train wreck. It just depends on the particular issue. Uh, I am someone who teaches... Uh, history and government and things like that, and have taught constitutional law before. So for me, the pick of Neil Gorsuch was a good choice. A lot of other stuff, not so much. But for those who are kind of on the side of, you know, everything he does is right, and it's always with the plan. He's playing like 8,000 dimension chess with the other side and just manipulating everything. Um, I don't think Trump's got that much Sith Lord in him, or at least not that much uh, Palpatine-esque Sith Lord in him. Um, but I do recall back whenever the film was first released that in 2005, there was a lot of talk about whether it was meant to be reflective of uh, what at the time was a George W. Bush government um, that at that point was a few years past 9-11, the Patriot Act and things like that. And this sort of going back to the same type of thing that we saw in 2002, right, with Attack of the Clones, uh, which was being produced at the time that 9-11 happened. And this idea of how much liberty are you willing to give away for protection? Um, and going back to the whole Ben Franklin thing, right, about the whole uh, liberty versus safety. And if you're willing to give up uh, essential freedoms to obtain a little temporary safety, you deserve neither. Um, I think in those respects, it's reflective. But I think it's less because Star Wars is trying to be reflective of American culture, because Lucas, you know, was basing things in the original trilogy on things like the Vietnam War and a little bit on, you know, the World War II and a little bit, a little bit on World War One, um, but sort of this idea that it's it's less about trying to capture a certain moment in time and more about trying to capture, you know, humanity and the patterns that we fall into and some of the uh, historical patterns that have existed. So in that sense, I think that it could be seen as reflective but no more so than it could be reflective of any other particular era of politics necessarily. Um, I think that if there's anywhere that we're seeing, and this is something that's discussion for another day, but if there's anywhere that it, we're seeing more political things reflected in Star Wars now, it's tending to be, if you call it political, I'm not even sure if I'd call it political, it's more of a social thing. It is the social changes happening in American society that have happened since the early 2000s, in terms of more women in uh, executive positions, in terms of more recognition for uh, people who are not white, male, et cetera, et cetera, as the heroes, um, except of course in the case of the solo film, and the diversity angle to it. I mean, they just put out the novel Last Shot that has uh, not the first in Star Wars, but uh, a gender non-binary character that is referred to as they. And then we had a gender non-binary character in the Aftermath books, going by G, and so on. That's not something you would have necessarily seen in Star Wars, say, 10 years ago. Um, of, but that's part of sort of Star Wars keeping up with the times, Star Wars kind of trying to reflect who the audience might be. I do think that we need to be able to sort of all see ourselves in Star Wars and Back in the day, we used to define ourselves as the type of people we were. We're, you know, we're the scoundrel. We're the scoundrel with the heart of gold. We're the adventurer. We're the one looking out to the future. We're the wise old man. Uh, we're the princess. We're the woman who's keeping all the guys around her from going insane uh, because she's the one with the plan like Leia. Um, and now, most of the time in society, we tend to define ourselves by things like race, um, sexual orientation, gender and things like that. And the gender thing, especially these days, becoming a more complex conversation um, as you have different schools of thought of whether gender and sex are identical um, or gender is a separate thing from sex or if there's a connection, um, you know, genotype, phenotype kind of stuff. 
And in essence, it's sort of reflecting that change of times. So as society moves quickly, Star Wars has moved as well. Um, I don't think it's so much that it's political, though. I think it's much more that it's a social kind of reflection. Like, I don't necessarily see much in Rogue One or Last Jedi or The Force Awakens that really make me think, aha, this is the Trump administration, the Obama administration. This is the UN these days. This is equating to Syria or Iraq. I just don't really see that. Um, it's more just looking at the general trends and how a changing fan base in a changing society makes for a changing Star Wars, for better or worse. Um, let's see. Uh, number four, what piqued your interest in doing Star Wars Home Video Library in the first place? I'm assuming um, maybe the collection and the show. So the collection was because you see all this stuff back here? Um, the bulk of this is Legends continuity. Um, basically up until really two shelves over here and then up until about here on the next shelf, give or take. Um, it's basically Legends continuity stuff. And I've been collecting the different books in first format for a while and the comics in first format and that sort of thing. And the end result was that I pretty much had all of it or all that I was wanting to collect. And at that point, I was basically just collecting signed copies to replace old copies with and stuff like that, which was, wasn't really an ongoing hunt for stuff. So instead, I looked for, you know, what's something else I'm interested in that I might get into uh, collecting wise? And that's where I started collecting the home video stuff that I already had some of, but not nearly as much as I have now. Um, and I'd already been doing from the Star Wars library as an ongoing series, looking at the Star Wars books in publication order, which ended and went on indefinite hiatus, may come back if the Patreon hits a certain amount, but I actually doubt that's going to happen at this point, um, just in terms of that target being a little high. But um, because I already had that format going, I decided to start using that same format to look at uh, home video releases, and then that just sort of took on a life of its own at that point, eventually leading to the book uh, and everything else, which I guess we'll deal with later because somebody does ask about that later on. But it was really just, you know, I was looking for something else I was interested in to collect, and I tend to like to teach. I like to explain um, and share ideas and have the conversation, so why not? If I'm interested in something enough to collect it, why not do a show about it? Uh, this question coming in from that guy with autism, as his username here. Uh, do you think DVD is mostly dead at this point? I would say hopefully, but not quite yet. I think there's still sort of that lingering, you know, grasping by its fingertips on the ledge um, lifespan left for DVD, primarily for extremely cheap films um, as far as purchasing them uh, and for things like, you know, like for little kids, right? Like if I've got the choice between buying a movie on Blu-ray or DVD, um, say it's one that where they don't come together, like in the UK, and I'm buying it for a child who's going to be watching it with their grubby little fingers all the time, then I'll probably buy the DVD because they're not going to care about the resolution and it's a cheaper cost for something that's probably going to get messed up anyway. Um, but I think for the general audiences, yeah, we're, we're about to the death point of DVD. Um, the fact that now you're starting to see a move away from DVD even in combo packs is kind of surprising. And I actually didn't notice this before because I bought the 4K version of Thor. So I had the 4K version, the Blu-ray, and the digital copy, and then I had gotten a 3D copy from the UK. But I looked at the multi-screen edition of Thor Ragnarok today when I was at Target, and it has Blu-ray, DVD, digital. But for Last Jedi, it's just Blu-ray digital, unless you get the multi-screen edition from Disney Movie Club. So they're starting to phase out DVDs, seemingly starting with Last Jedi, and if they keep that pattern up and more companies start leaning that direction, the chances of them producing a whole bunch of DVD-only copies of new films seems fairly unlikely in the long term here. Um, it's like DVD was living mainly because it was being packed in with Blu-rays in the U.S., but that's not going to be the case. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be dying in other markets. I mean, take the case of something like Blu-ray 3D. Uh, Blu-ray 3D is more or less dead in the United States outside of a few companies still putting them out. Like, you'll still see them put out by Warner Brothers for the DC uh, comic films, right? But most companies have given up on 3D copies in the US and now you have to import them from the UK. Why the UK? Because places like the UK and Japan and elsewhere, 3D is still pretty big, at least relative to here, which isn't to say much. Um, so you can still get them over there. Um, what's, what'll be interesting to see is what happens when DVD starts to die in certain markets, but still lives in other markets, 
because DVDs, by and large, are region locked. And part of that is because of the resolution lines in PAL versus NTSC and that sort of thing. Um, but take something like a region like Japan that is NTSC, just like the U.S. is. Um, at some point, are we going to start to see people who want DVD but can't find them here importing them from Japan? And uh, will there be efforts made to make that a seamless process? Kind of like now where the Blu-ray 3D discs that you might get from the UK, in most cases, are all region instead of region locked. Except in the case of Valerian, which pisses me off because I really, really wanted to see Valerian at home in 3D and can't. That last part took a weird turn, didn't it? Valerian! It's actually a pretty good film. I haven't ever read the comics that, uh, that lead into it. It's weird, but it's good. Um, next question comes from Mouse in the Casino, hashtag YOLO. That's the whole username here. It says, uh, just like Republic Forces Radio Network, did you do a Star Wars Rebels version of that? Talking about the podcast, Republic Forces Radio Network, that uh, I was a part of for several years that basically did episodic coverage of the Clone Wars. Um, yes, we did, but only for the first two seasons of Rebels because it just got too difficult to get everybody's schedules together to continue. Um, but if you go on StarWarsReport.com and look up a show called Rebels Roundtable or the Star Wars Report's Rebels Roundtable, uh, you'll find that one, which is what we did to pick up with season six of the Clone Wars, actually, the Lost Mission stuff, and then straight on through the first couple seasons of Rebels. Haven't done anything past the second season of Rebels yet, although um, my partner in podcasting for Star Wars Beyond the Films, Mark Herleman, he and Barrett Lawton, Barrett was on Republic Forces Radio Network, and both he and Mark were on Rebels Roundtable. Um, they and their children are doing a show now based on Rebels uh, called Padawan Perspective that's pretty interesting. That's also over there uh, at StarWarsReport.com. Indie Defense asks, what's your take on the online backlash to The Last Jedi? Um, I mean, I think it comes down to a few things. Um, one, you've got just the pent-up continual anger over Legends versus Canon in the first place. Right? There are people who will never accept a new Star Wars film ever because it is not what came before. Um, I, I actually, it was, it was funny because I posted a, a joke, basically, a sarcastic comment on Facebook that was basically, um, um, what was it? The Last Jedi is complete shit. Oh, wow. So you didn't like the movie, huh? No, man, it's garbage. So you saw it? No, I refuse to see anything like that. Then how do you know? right? And immediately got a response from a friend of mine who basically went on a tear about that exact thing, how he will never watch anything like that because it's not their, his Star Wars and he knows it's going to be horrible and SJW this and that. Um, huge rant. Um, so to some degree, there's just this pent up anger that isn't even really about the film. It's about something completely different. Whether it's, as in that case, whether it's a social thing where it's like politics invading Star Wars, kind of the stuff I talked about a little bit ago, whether it's that, and it's sort of a reflection of the toxic society around Star Wars kind of affecting Star Wars, or if it's a matter of the change of Star Wars creating bad blood and that bad blood continuing forward. Um, but I think part of it, a big part of it, at least from what I'm seeing uh, for people that I talk to who don't like it, but are also rational enough to have a conversation about it, always be willing to have a rational conversation, seriously, um, is that to some degree, Star Wars for a long time was kind of comfort food. We knew what to expect. When was the last time, aside from Last Jedi, that a Star Wars story really surprised you? I mean, really surprised you. Whether we're talking about TV, maybe every once in a while on Rebels, or we're talking about the films, most of the time a Star Wars story is not going to surprise you. It'll be formulaic, there'll be some cool moments in it, but more than likely, with some basic gist of what the story is expected to be, you could sort of plot out the rest of it. And there's not a lot of unexpected twists and turns, at least not in the big picture of the plot of the stories. Whereas Last Jedi was doing that a lot. It was challenging conventional ideas on Star Wars. That's not comfort food. That's taking a new direction. That is challenging assumptions and so on. And Whereas I'm looking for a new, engaging, fun Star Wars story and found it to be engaging and to ask interesting questions, others are looking to it, looking for sort of the nostalgia of recapturing the past and wanting Star Wars to continue to be that comfort food. And in a lot of ways, The Last Jedi was not comfort food. You know, like you're going into the kitchen and you're looking for a brownie and instead you grab a jalapeno. 
vastly different experience, and if you weren't expecting the jalapeno, then you're probably going to be pretty pissed about who put it inside the pan where the brownies should be. But I do think for the majority of Star Wars fans, they either like it or they don't. And they don't really care if other people like it or they don't. They're just like, yeah, I like what I like. It's that, of course, as always in the social media, you know, cacophony out there, it's the louder extremes that tend to get the attention. Um, I doubt there's as much hate out there for that film as there is, um, say, or, or any more than there is, say, for the prequels or for the Clone Wars, right? Um, it's just people's tastes and preferences. Marco Damasi asks, are you a Star Trek fan? And if so, what's your favorite series, captain, movie, particular episode? Uh, great videos, man. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Uh, I am a Star Trek fan, not as much as Star Wars, of course. Um, I got into Trek right around the time of, I guess, season five of Next Generation at that anniversary type time. Um, so I was able to jump onto Deep Space Nine when it first started. Watched all of Next Generation a lot at the time. Eventually got a chance to see the original series. Um, followed... Deep Space Nine up until about season five, six, give or take, and then equivalently around that time in Voyager, stopped watching both, really, but kept up with the movies, didn't watch Enterprise when it was originally on TV, and then eventually caught up with Enterprise on Netflix, and just recently finished this massive, massive, months-long marathon, if you want to call it that, of Enterprise, original series, animated series, yes, animated series too. Uh, original crew films, Next Generation, then start integrating it and alternating it with, with Deep Space Nine, then, it, then alternating that and Voyager and the Next Generation films on down the line. Uh, and my wife and I have been following Discovery as it airs, uh, or as it is released, I guess not really considered airing, through the CBS All Access app, which yes, we did pay for just for Discovery, but thankfully we're able to watch Young Sheldon and SEAL Team also, which we both like, uh, and Criminal Minds for that matter. So... Um, favorites, favorite series I would say is, um, it's probably Deep Space Nine now, uh, with the depth of the characters. I originally was put off by Deep Space Nine because I'm a big Babylon 5 fan and there was a whole thing about Straczynski shopping around the original pilot script for Babylon 5, Paramount saying no, and then basically tossing a lot of the ideas from it over to Berman and Pillar, I think it was, saying, hey, Make sure these are in your Trek thing, right down to a shape-shifting security chief that eventually didn't wind up on B5 because of budget, but was in that pilot script. And it's pretty much exactly how they set up the character of Odo initially in Deep Space Nine. See, even my cat's pissed about it, um, if you can hear that. But basically, um, in rewatching it years after the fact, just in the last few months, I was able to just appreciate it for what it was in a lot of ways. In fact, I actually really appreciated Voyager for what it was more than I did when it was first aired, because I was always comparing it to Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, but I was able to sort of watch it as its own thing. But if it really came down to it, it wouldn't be Deep Space Nine. I think of Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, Voyager, original series as the four that you're expected to choose from. Discovery is actually my favorite but I'm not sure it should be counted among the others, so usually when asked about a favorite, I sort of leave that off to the side. Kind of like the animated series. And somebody said, what's the worst? Of course the animated series was the worst one. But you usually leave that out of conversation. So, big on Discovery. Um, favorite captain? Uh, I very much like Cisco. I definitely like Cisco. Um, I have a new appreciation for Janeway these days after having just rewatched Voyager, but absolutely, uh, Ben Cisco is my favorite of the characters. He, he brings everything together into one place. And uh, particularly, I was taken on this viewing, this is before I knew we were having a baby, um, taken by the fatherhood angle, which is something with his connection and, and his interaction with Jake I, that just didn't resonate with me when I was younger watching it when it was first on television. Um, but now it has. Now, again, close second, Lorca from Discovery. But if I explained why, it would spoil parts of Discovery for people who haven't seen it yet watch Discovery when you can. Just don't expect it to be like all the old series. Um, favorite movie? That's a tough one. I'm either going to go with First Contact because of just the action nature of it and the way that it plays into Next Generation and Voyager both and to a small degree into Deep Space Nine uh, or probably Undiscovered Country. Um, being a history guy, a lot of the sentiments and a lot of the parts of Undiscovered Country really resonate with me. The idea of an old guard not willing to let go of old conflicts and move on. 
keeping in mind that at the time that the film was being made, I mean, we were just a while out from the Cold War. Um, that type of thing is good. And, and the conversation there between Kirk and Spock, you know, yo, Jim, they are dying. Let them die. Holy shit. Can you say let them die? But that was very much sort of that, that East-West kind of feel um, still after the Cold War. So for me, six stands out a lot. Particular episode... I always love the time travel episodes or the Mirror Universe episodes. I would probably say, though, the one that really strikes me, the one that has stayed with me for years, is Yesterday's Enterprise. Um, not just because the Enterprise C is in it, but that was part of it, but the whole Tasha Yar angle. Um, you know, if you go back and fix things, this character who everybody's excited to see back again is going to be dead again. Um, and what bearing does that have on the character and the choices that they make? And then, of course, it's set up stuff for uh, uh, her daughter to show up later and be an okay addition anyway. Then we have a question from Connor Styron, who asks, I think it's, how you pronounce it, Styron? Styron? Uh, Do you know about the international releases of the 2003 DVD-only versions of the prequel and original trilogies? And if so, will you cover them if you end up getting your hands on them sometime soon? You mean these? Yes, um, I actually did find them recently, thanks to a buddy of mine pointing them out, and I was able to find them uh, on eBay. It was actually a U.S. seller who constantly was reminding me, they're not going to play in the U.S. These are Region 2, these are Region 2. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it's cool. I, I know that, but thank you for reminding me for like the third time. Um, but yes, I'll be covering them soon. I'm from the Star Wars Home Video Library. I just want to check out the contents, and I found that I am able to do that with VLC and my crappy little plug-in USB DVD drive. Uh, that I have in the other room. So once I get a chance to actually check out the contents, I will be covering them uh, on from the Star Wars Home Video Library. And of course, they'll then appear as a sidebar in the second edition of A Saga on Home Video, a fan's guide to U.S. Star Wars Home Video releases, my book about the subject, which is available on Amazon now in its first edition and will be coming in the years to come in a second edition. But somebody asked about that later, so I'll hold that answer. Then Kenny Crayley asks, with so much Star Wars content coming out, TV shows, to the movies, books, and comics, is it hard to keep up with everything? Uh, depends on what I'm trying to do. If I'm trying to keep up with it in terms of reading, usually I can keep up with the comics and the books, TV shows, movies, and stuff like that fairly quickly because I read fairly fast. It's more that I have trouble keeping up with things like the RPG books, but that's because right now, anytime I'm reading those things, I'm trying to take notes on chronological references and continuity references and such so that when then I'm done reading it, I can summarize it for the Star Wars Timeline Gold and add event references and all kinds of stuff like that into that document. It's reading as pleasure and research at the same time. Now that the Star Wars Timeline Gold is ending with its 2018 release, I expect my ability to keep up even with stuff like the RPG books will be much faster because I won't be constantly stopping and taking notes or having to summarize between finishing reading one and beginning reading another, I'll actually be able to just plow right on through uh, and check them all out. So, so far, it's not crazy difficult to keep up for reading. It is a little bit difficult to keep up as things pile up to summarize for the timeline, but that will be a non-issue after July slash August or so. Now, we've got a ton more questions still to go, but the raw recording is getting on about 46 minutes before I edit it or anything. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it here. And then we'll have another episode coming up right after this one, uh, hopefully released within a matter of a day or so, maybe a little bit more than that, where I'll pick up with even more questions from that same thread of questions uh, solicited the other day and now being answered. So to start with, thank you all for those who have submitted your questions, who either I got a chance to answer this time or that I'll be answering uh, next time or maybe even the time after that, depends on how many episodes we need to get all the answers in. Uh, thank you very much. For watching, may the force be with you, and I'll see you next time for more of the Q&A.